Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation, Stronger, an interest-based look at understanding the China challenge, hosted by the Eisenhower Institute at Gettysburg College. I'm Rob Boyer. I am an Associate Provost and Dean of Public, Poli Poli Public Policy Programs at the college. And today's event is part of a series of conversations exploring this critical moment in history. Our world stands at a crossroads with policymakers and citizens facing, <clears throat> excuse me, facing long-term issues and new challenges. Among these questions is the evolving relationship between the United States and China. Not since the Cold War has the US faced such competition on the world stage, but as our guest today argues, approaching US-China relations simply as a great power rivalry has its own risks and costs. Today's discussion will explore how US policymakers can craft a more constructive China policy that advances American interests against the backdrop of changing Chinese global ambitions. Audience members can join the conversation by sharing your question using Zoom's Q&A feature. We are fortunate to have with us today two distinguished China experts. Ryan Haas is a senior fellow and the Michael H. Armacost Chair in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, where he holds a joint appointment to the John L. Thornton China Center and the Center for East Asia Policy Studies. He is also the interim Chen Fu and Cecilia Yen Ku Chair in Taiwan Studies. From 2013 to 2017, Haas served as the Director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia at the National Security Council staff. He's the author of a new book, Stronger, Adapting America's China Strategy in an Age of Competitive Interdependence. Our moderator is Kevin Neeler, a principal at the Scowcroft Group. He has worked on China issues in the private sector, at the State Department, and for the Senate Majority Leader. From 2014 to 2017, he served on the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. Thank you both for joining us today, and we're looking forward to the conversation. Professor Boer, thanks so much for uh, for that introduction. Uh, it, it's a great privilege to be here. My thanks to our colleagues, the Eisenhower Institute for, for gathering us together. Um, Ryan Haas's new book uh, is, I think, gonna be uh, uh, something that uh, we'll all be talking about uh, for quite some time. It, it, uh, it arrives at a propitious moment uh, and, and indeed we're, we're meeting today uh, at, at the week that uh, Ryan's former colleagues um, at the, uh, the, the current Secretary of State uh, and the National Security Advisor are having their first meetings uh, with their Chinese colleagues. Uh, so we, we couldn't be having this discussion uh, at a better moment. Uh, Ryan, I know you want to use uh, th this occasion to, to talk about the U.S.-China relationship broadly, not just the book, but I'm, I'm going to insist we, uh, we talk uh, uh, foundationally about the book because there's, so there's so much in it uh, that shapes this conversation powerfully. Uh, let me begin by asking, early in the book, uh, you describe U.S.-China relations now at, at, at being at an inflection point. Could you take that apart for us a little bit and, and talk about how the current circumstances feel different from you in your long experience uh, with the bilateral relationship from the period you and I studied immediately after the communist revolution in 49, the Eisenhower era crisis uh, over Taiwan and the, uh, the, the islands and the post Tiananmen massacre tensions that were uh, foundational to, uh, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the relationship for the last couple of years. And let me also urge, take a moment if you could, because I think you do a terrific job in the book of unpacking the difference between Sino-US rivalries now and the thing that was such an important part of my early career uh, in government, uh, the Cold War uh, and the competition between the US and the Soviet Union then. Uh, can I ask you to, to untangle both of those uh, 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 conundrums for us? Well, I, I will do my best uh, to do so. But before I uh, attempt to do so, let me just say thanks to you, Kevin. Uh, I've learned so much uh, working with you and, uh, and being around you. Uh, and I, I hope that you hear your voice in the book because it certain, your, uh, your views have certainly informed it. Uh, it's also a privilege for me to be at the Eisenhower Institute. Uh, because I think that, that President Eisenhower, his, you know, his steely-eyed, tough-minded pragmatism is really the, the type of spirit that I'm trying to channel uh, for the purpose of this book. But to, to get to the specific questions that you put on the table, 
uh, I think that we are at an inflection point in the U.S.-China relationship because both sides are broadly dissatisfied with the status quo. Uh, both have contributed to pushing the relationship to its current, uh, current point. From China's perspective, uh, I think that there are a few things happening. One that I observe as an American is that the Chinese have gone from, from being the most self-aware rising power in recent history to an impatiently assertive power in the span of the last decade or so. You know, uh, when I was in Embassy Beijing in 2008 to through 2012, I was struck by how conscious of history the Chinese were, how they had studied what happened uh, when Bismarck's patients gave way to Kaiser Wilhelm's inpatients, uh, the period after the Meiji Restoration when Japan grew impatiently assertive. Uh, the, the mistakes of the Soviet Union in confronting the United States in global ideological struggle. And they had committed themselves not to fall into those traps. But yet here we are. Uh, and so it raises a fundamental question as to why. Why has China unlearned the lessons that they were so committed to following for so long? I think also uh, during recent years, uh, any lingering hopes of political reform in China have been vanquished. Uh, the reforms that Deng Xiaoping put in motion to distribute power, to ensure orderly succession of power um, have really crumbled. And we've seen a, a real consolidation of power around Xi Jinping. So on the Chinese side, there have been um, appreciable changes. But I think from Beijing's perspective, they would argue uh, a similar story in reverse, uh, that the United States is going through a highly disruptive period uh, through the fourth industrial revolution, through a pretty dramatic demographic shift uh, inside our country. And many Americans feel like they're working harder only to fall further behind uh, into a debt that they'll never be able to repay. Um, and there is a prevailing view that the Chinese are stealing and cheating. They're acting unfairly in ways that disadvantage American workers and American businesses. And we see this growing anger reflected across the political spectrum. Uh, just about every major political constituency in the United States has its own grievances about China's conduct. It's also reflected in public polling, uh, where there is broad dissatisfaction uh, that has been rising in recent years about Chinese behavior. So if you add those things together, I, I think that you begin to form the picture of why uh, the relationship has moved in this direction. But it's different now than it was uh, in the historical periods you cited, because China is a different challenge to the United States than it was before. China is no longer a fraction of America's power. Uh, you know, just in 2000, uh, America's economy was 10 times larger than China's. In 2006, on the eve of the global financial crisis, our economy was five times larger than China's. Now it's around 35% larger. So China is, uh, you know, very quickly becoming a near peer and uh, its actions are affecting Americans in very direct ways. My, uh, uh, that, that's very helpful in, in framing the issue, but let me ask you, you I, I recall early in the book, you, you're quoting Defense Secretary, former Defense Secretary James Schlesinger in his cautionary note about the 10 foot tall syndrome. Uh, he warned uh, that uh, uh, our analysis of the Soviet Union, our, our, in fact, our misunderstanding of Soviet capabilities came down to describing in this hyperbolic terms, everything the Russians did as being uh, uh, so much uh, so much more daunting, so much more of a challenge to the US than uh, we subsequently learned was the case, that, that, the, uh, that the plan's reality mismatch, as it was called uh, in the intelligence community, was really profound. It, 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 does that concern you as, as we look at China? I'm mindful of what you said about the economic growth, uh, but, but uh, take a moment, if you would, please, to talk about some of what you describe in the books and the, the asymmetries in where China is now, uh, both in the, in the economic portfolio and, uh, um, and, and, and in the security portfolio. And, and then when I get you through that, let me, let me get you to talk a bit about uh, China's domestic situation in depth. But, but first, sir, uh, how, do you, how do you pierce the veil of the uh, China's world's largest country, China's world's largest army. Uh, how do you get beyond that part of the conversation to get an interest-based look at where the two countries stand? Well, I'm, I'm really glad that you raised this question, Kevin, um, because I have grown concerned that we are falling into the 10-foot-tall syndrome again. Uh, 
uh, as it relates to China. And my concern was first peaked, just to be perfectly candid, uh, during a trip to Trump Tower uh, at the end of 2016. President Trump had, President elect Trump at the time, had just won the election. And uh, I was serving at the National Security Council. And we were sent uh, to Trump Tower to explain the logic and sort of theory of the case of how the United States approached China uh, during the previous four years. Not to try to put any spin on the ball or persuade the incoming team of the wisdom of our efforts, but just to provide them with a proper accounting of how we got to the point that we were in the relationship. And uh, we, we began briefing the, the incoming team about uh, some of the logic of, of our approach, what worked, what didn't. And uh, very quickly, um, the person on the other side of the table basically just put his hand up and said, I've heard enough. Uh, the problem with you guys, you Obama guys, is you don't understand that we are in a, a colossal existential struggle and that if the United States does not prevail over China, the United States may cease to exist within the next 50 years. And I, I was just struck by, uh, by this because, you know, from where I sat, uh, the United States remained um, the dominant power in the relationship by a pretty commanding margin. And over the course of the, the following several years, uh, I began to see this anxiety and uncertainty about America's ability to compete with China uh, you know, reappear uh, and, and be echoed into policy. I watched the Secretary of State um, travel around the world warning that the Chinese were coming as if this was a revelation. And what, what bothered me about it was that it was an advertisement of our own insecurities. Um, when we treat the Chinese as if they are 10 feet tall, uh, it causes our allies to, to wonder if we know something about China's capabilities and our limitations that they don't. Uh, and, you know, it also sends a demand signal throughout the government to try to block and obstruct China wherever they are, whatever they're doing, without respect to whether the Chinese action implicates any of our vital interests or top concerns. And, you know, I just find that in human nature and in diplomacy, uh, insecurity and anxiety are unattractive, uh, unattractive approaches. And so part of what I'm trying to do through this book is to make the case that we are still the stronger power. Uh, we can afford to have a, a steady, patient, persistent, firm approach for dealing with China um, that is rooted in our own uh, recognition of our advantages as well as China's vulnerabilities. There are a lot of asymmetries in the relationship. I had the privilege of this time last year, you were kind enough to help me prepare to, uh, uh, to go up and, and speak both to uh, uh, faculty and students at, um, at West Point. Uh, and in the faculty lunch, um, uh, I, I, the conversation turned to just this issue. And um, one of the flag rank officers said, gee, you know, as, as, as people on the outside, and he was talking about you know, our, our Washington community of China analysts, as they look at China, do they not understand that the United States has been at war constantly for two decades? There's virtually no officer above the rank of, of, of major who hasn't been typically in two. Uh, she served in one or two combat uh, uh, theaters. Uh, by contrast, uh, no current Chinese uh, uh, military officer has been uh, we'll put India, the India border skirmish aside, has been in a major engagement since 1967, right? So we, we have over 2 million veterans. Um, we actually know a thing about power projection, uh, not, not from textbooks, but from bitter experience. Uh, so uh, the, the, the contrast is jarring when you hear people describe uh, a, a China ambitiously gobbling up the world um, it's, it, it must, it must co be cognitive dissonance for you sometimes. Yeah. I, I really struggle to, to recognize the caricature of China that has taken root, uh, in our discourse inside the United States. But part of the challenge, I think, Kevin, and I'd love to hear your reaction to this, but there's so much volume of information on China. Uh, every day there's a new op-ed every day. There's a new journal article. There's a book every week, um, that, to stand out, you really need to be flashy and fear-inducing. Um, and the marketplace has become so competitive that, uh, that balanced appraisals uh, struggle to break through the noise. And it's also, frankly, the same in government. Uh, you know, the running joke inside the Defense Department is that if you really need to get your project funded, you just need to find a way to attach China and artificial intelligence to the title, and you're good. 
right? So uh, we need to find a way to take a step back and sort of right size, I think, the risks and the opportunities uh, that, that we face with China. Let me ask you to take a look from the other side of the mirror, because one of the things you've brought to your government experience uh, because of the time you spent in the country, uh, and I know one of the things that was jarring about many of the Trump appointments was a lot of the people talking about China actually had never been there, let alone had any uh, depth of field in, in, uh, in, in managing China issues. By contrast, um, you and your family lived there for many years uh, um, and, and, and you've got relationships there. I want to describe them as friendships because uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're uh, gimlet-eyed professional relationships where Chinese officials know and value what you have to say. And, and for their part, uh, 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 they've, they've got a need for their own credibility to, to, to tell you some ground truths, as the intelligence community calls them. Could you take a moment and walk us through uh, where you think attitudes inside China are at the moment, and in particular with the, the Xi administration? And you point out in the book, uh, the inflection point, uh, this move towards a, a more muscular and aggressive uh, view of their relationship with the world uh, was derivative in, in no small part of the economic crisis in 2008. And it really started, but it started before Xi Jinping came in. But since he's come in, what do you see as the shift in Chinese goals and objectives? Uh, what are you hearing from Chinese colleagues about uh, the change in attitude in their view of the United States and foreign policy more broadly? In particular, though, how they see themselves in the region. What's different between the China now and the one you knew 10 years ago? Well, that's a, that's a fantastic question and something that I will reflect on. But, you know, for the sake of conversation, I guess I would start out by saying that 2010, I think, was a dramatic moment. Uh, there was a pretty visible public debate uh, amongst Chinese intellectuals and scholars and experts about Chinese foreign policy orientation, their view of the world. So and, say more about that meeting, if you would. That it, it, uh, my understanding is that that's a conversation internally that yeah. has only happened a couple times in Chinese history. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And and this this debate bubbled up into the open, uh, where people, in a very fractious manner, were debating whether or not it's time for China to continue with uh, you know this this old dictum of hiding hiding your strength and biding your time, Tao Guangyanghui or whether it's time for China to stand up and assert itself as the great power that it knew it was and would be. And at that time in 2010, uh, then the state counselor, the head of foreign policy for China, put down the conversation and said, enough. Uh, we're going to stay the course, stay steady, keep our head down, and uh, continue to, to amass uh, influence and strength. Fast forward a few years and there's a foreign affairs work conference, only the fourth of its kind in the history of uh, modern China, where Xi Jinping basically presided over the, um, the burial of the idea of hiding strength and biding time and said, no, now is, now is China's time to stand up and, uh, and to be counted among the, the great global powers. And I think that that was, you know, looking back but with the benefit of hindsight, that was a pretty pivotal moment um, because if you date Chinese actions from then, we've seen them uh, much more tolerant of risk and friction with the United States and with others, and much more aggressive uh, and impatient in pursuit of their interest. Um, and even if you look at uh, statements in recent months by top Chinese leaders, I mean, Xi Jinping is saying that time and momentum is on China's side, uh, which you know betrays a pretty hard-nosed zero-sum outlook of the world. Uh, suggests that it's not on uh, someone else, America's side. Um, and others have said the East is West, the, the East is rising and the West is declining, uh, which again suggests this, uh, this duality. But I would just caution not uh, to have people over extrapolate from those data points, because uh, you know, if you take a snapshot of attitudes at any moment in you know, recent Chinese history, it can be pretty jarring. Uh, but this is a, there is fluidity uh, to China's thinking about its place in the region and the world. Uh, they are adaptive, I believe. 
Um, they are opportunistic and aggressive in pursuing their interests, but they're not reckless uh, or suicidal uh, with that bloody minded determination to, to run against all obstacles in pursuit of them. And I think so, if, if China thinks that they have time on their side, they can afford to, uh, to avoid direct confrontation, be patient and, and trust that uh, over time, the benefits will accrue to them. So you think that kind of patience is shaping the goals now. There's this aspirational view based on what Xi Jinping has said and, and what you and I hear from the, what are called the wolf warrior diplomats, the people who are out there pushing the hard line, but the incentive structure is still powerfully not to get it wrong. And it, it's to avoid missteps uh, rather than, than, than take the extreme measures that, for instance, with, with the Soviets, we saw uh, in, 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 in instances like the Cuban Missile Crisis and whatnot, they're not, it's your judgment that the Chinese leadership is about not presenting itself with existential risks that disturb the domestic story. And, and, and say more, if you would, about how in the Chinese leadership structure, um, how domestic policy and the challenges of this, of this enormous and exquisitely complicated system, uh, how that fills the day of, of leadership's decision time, as opposed to foreign policy, because you know, we as Americans are used to uh, constantly being aware of a role in the world and um, how America is perceived elsewhere uh, and of American responsibilities. Um, it, that's not really the norm for the Chinese, is it? And, and how, how do they manage, how does leadership manage the competing desires of domestic stability, growth, and whatnot against this, this aspirational, aggressive foreign policy agenda. How do those things fit together in your mind? Well, it's, uh, it's a huge question. I, I think that, um, I mean, this is a subject of debate, so everyone will have their own views on, on this question. But, uh, you know, I, I am very much of the view that the Chinese are guided by their identification of their national interest. Uh, and that those, those views are adaptable uh, and shapeable, uh, that the Chinese are not uh, seeking out or courting conflict with uh, the United States. They recognize uh, the power asymmetry that still exists between the United States and China. But at the same time, uh, as ideology has become less of a source of social cohesion inside China, at least outside of the 90 million members of the Chinese Communist Party, and as economic growth is no longer the, the performance validator uh, that it had been previously as, as growth numbers uh, steadily begin to taper off, I, I do think that Xi Jinping has leaned heavier on nationalism um, as a basis for consolidating his support and the support of the Chinese Communist Party. This belief, this, this um, sort of narrative that China is on the rise and that China can't be stopped and uh, we will get what's ours, um, just trust us. And so that's, uh, that's a dangerous cocktail. I, and I, I say that because I don't want to sugarcoat or, or leave anyone with the impression that, uh, that I undervalue the risks that China poses to us or others. But what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the Chinese still have heavy incentives to avoid um, going toe to toe with the United States right now. And I think it's our job to keep it that way with firmness and steadiness uh, so that uh, the, they remain sober about, uh, about those risks. But there, on your point, uh, I think that when Xi Jinping wakes up every morning, the first 50 things he thinks about are domestic and maybe the 51st will be foreign, but that's only on a day when there's big action overseas. Uh, you know, the, his, his incentive structure, his performance evaluation is heavily der derivative of uh, his performance at home. It, it, you know, that's such an insight. I, I remember um, uh, some years ago uh, really being uh, impressed by the fact that over 60 percent of your evaluation as a Communist Party official is determined by how you promote stability. Now, now you know, if 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 you were if you were working at Google or or, or uh, uh, Ford Motor or or, or Hershey's. Uh, and, and you told your boss that you'd, uh, you'd achieved your, your goals by 60%, 60% uh, of your goals have been achieved by not, make, not making anything happen, 
um, that would uh, that would that would that would probably not lead to a raise. But the, your, your use of the phrase incentive structure, I think, is is powerfully instructive for those of us who don't have your insights of of how the Communist Party is organized and how how thought moves through that complex organization. Um, I, I want to say I, I, at the outset, I I, I I insisted that this book is going to be a durable contribution to the literature, and I think that's in part true. Because you introduced an idea that uh, is is uh, it's, it's just one of these kind of uh, lightning bolts of clarity that, in a phrase, captures uh, better than anything else I've seen where we probably are against this this backdrop that you described. And you've coined the phrase competitive interdependence. Break that down for us, and and if you would describe a little bit. What that what that should look like in a high functional U.S. policy? What what is what does that mean for the reality that that policymakers like yourself are dealing with? Well, thank you for for bringing this out. I, I think that um, competitive interdependence is basically intended to signal that the relationship is fundamentally competitive and will remain so for the foreseeable future. But at the same time, uh, the United States and China are both impacted heavily, for good or ill, uh, by the actions of the other. Uh, the competitive nature of the relationship, I think, is uh, a function of the fact that we have different governance and economic systems. Uh, we both have global and regional ambitions that are at odds with each other. And there are just many areas of the relationship where we have irreconcilably different views, uh, whether it's on Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Taiwan, human rights, uh, the role of values and democracy. And so none of these things are going to be solved uh, and, and put into a, a you know, a basket of completed tasks. They're just going to be with us. Um, but at the same time, the United States and China were both major economies with large populations, global interests, and significant militaries. No other country in the world possesses all four of those attributes, only the United States and China. And there's also a dense web of economic relationships between us, $400 billion uh, uh, of sales by American companies into the Chinese market, $700 billion of two-way trade every year. These are massive sums. Uh, a lot of knowledge production takes place between the West Coast of the United States and the East Coast of China. And neither country is going to be able to impose its will on the other. Uh, neither country is going to be able to solve these big 21st century challenges alone. Uh, we're only gonna be able to do it if we find ways to move in the same direction. And so that's, uh, that's the essence of what I'm trying to describe is that not necessarily because of amity or goodwill, um, but just out of just a sheer cold eyed calculation of the way that the two major countries relate to each other, we're going to be bound together uh, in an interdependent fashion, uh, even as the competition continues to brew. That's a powerful construct and it, um, it, 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 uh, it frames the rest of your discussion uh, with, I think, both realism and some optimism about, uh, especially as you go through in the book, and I, again, I urge people to read it because it's, it's such a toolbox of, uh, of what, uh, what the writer Saul Bellow called reality instruction, uh, the, where you, you put on a scale U.S. and Chinese assets uh, domestically and foreign, uh, and, and I think it's, it's such a good discipline because, um, again, as a reaction both to the 10 foot tall syndrome, uh, but in the necessity, especially coming out of the, uh, of, of the global pandemic, of, uh, of evaluating the assets that the U.S. has. Let, let me just, I, I don't want to abuse the privilege of the chair because we've got some great questions lined up and I want to get to those. And I know you want to, you want to turn this into a discussion with, uh, with our colleagues who are watching this. Uh, just as a last thought from my side, um, you, you've talked about uh, um, the opportunities and, and, and the downside risks, but in the near term, let's say for the next six months to a year, as the Biden folks firmly take the reins, as we come out of this first uh, formative meeting uh, with senior officials, and you, you know so well from your time in government, uh, policy is people. Uh, I, we, we dress this up in... Uh, and, and with, uh, with apologies to Professor Borer and, and our colleagues on faculty, we can dress this up with 
with political science theories. So much of it comes of, out of, is derivative of personal relationships and habits of cooperation. But, but mindful that, that uh, the Biden administration is, is in the process of reestablishing those uh, in a way that the Trump administration simply didn't care to and was indifferent to. Um, uh, what do you see as near-term risks? What issues, uh, what's out there in the calendar in the next uh, in the next six months to a year that challenges uh, a, a stable implementation of, uh, of 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 your idea of competitive interdependence? What what, what puts that model at risk? And what do you, what, frankly, what what keeps you up at night in terms of the U.S.-China relationship? Well, I think that you're in the process of uh, seeing the relationship shift gradually. Um, from a highly confrontation, confrontation relationship to a highly competitive relationship. Uh, and shifting from viewing each other as sort of zero-sum adversaries to competitors that we're going to have to deal with uh, without catastrophe uh, well into the future. And so that's, that feels like the, the process that is taking place. Um, the, a lot of uh, my friends and colleagues are very worried about Taiwan as a potential flashpoint in the coming months. And the commander of uh, forces in the Pacific uh, in OPECOM recently testified about his concerns uh, on Capitol Hill. I'm slightly less concerned than most uh, about the Taiwan account, simply because I think that, uh, that China has both a near-term objective and a long-term goal, and they remain confident in their capacity to achieve both. Um, they, the near-term objective is to prevent uh, permanent separation of Taiwan from the mainland or any declaration of independence. And the long-term goal is to achieve unification uh, between Taiwan and the mainland. And um, you know, the Chinese goal is to, uh, to block any long-term grift by China. They're using a lot of tools short of military conflict to do that right now. And I think that they still think that they have uh, a lot of tools in the toolbox. The, the long-term goal, uh, I think, is a function of their belief that as their military capabilities expand and their missile envelope becomes tighter uh, over Taiwan, that it'll just become cost prohibitive for the United States to come to Taiwan's defense. And eventually it'll just be Taiwan and the mainland dealing with each other, which is where Beijing would like to take things. And so they, I think that they still believe that they have time on their side and the luxury of patience. Um, and so I, I, I certainly want, uh, Suggest that uh, that you know that we be complacent about the risk from Taiwan, but I I also think that there's a risk to overcranking the alarm because it serves Beijing's purpose. Uh, Beijing is trying to put psychological pressure on the people of Taiwan uh, into thinking that they have no recourse other than to st step into the warm embrace of Beijing for their uh, security and prosperity. And so we I think we need to be careful on that. But to to try to put a few concrete ideas on the table. It's going to be hard, I think, for the relationship to improve if China is continuing to strongly coerce America's allies. Um, it's going to compel the United States to come to Australia and other other countries' defense in ways that are just going to be, you know, friction-inducing. And uh, as long as China continues to try to sell the idea that uh, COVID-19 is, uh, you know, the outgrowth of a chemical weapons or biological weapons experiment gone wrong inside the United States. Um, that's just going to, you know, put a firm barrier on the ability of our two countries to cooperate, even though it would serve both countries benefit to work together to stamp out the coronavirus wherever it exists around the world. Let me, uh, let me ask our colleague, uh, Lauren Cole to, uh, to moderate questions if I can. Uh, Lauren, uh, you're better at this than I am. Go right ahead. Thank you. Kevin Ryan, thank you so much for joining us at the Eisenhower Institute this afternoon. It's a pleasure to hear you guys have this conversation. Um, to turn it over to questions, um, our first is from Dimitri S., who is a U.S.-China correspondent for the Financial Times. Um, for Ryan, given that, that the U.S. misread Xi Jinping and his plan for China before he came to power, how confident are you that the U.S. government has a good sense of the up and coming Chinese leaders when it comes to debating how China might change when she does move on? Well, let's say Dimitri threw us a, a fastball, Kevin. Um, I'm going to ask for your, your help in, in addressing this. But 
you know, it wasn't just the United States that uh, underappreciated who Xi Jinping was. It was also the other members of the Chinese leadership. Um, and so I would hate to, you know, extrapolate from, from this event that it's impossible for us to understand the incentives or ambitions of China's future leaders. Uh, we've had a pretty good feel in the past uh, for where China has wanted to take things. Uh, and I, I do think that broadly speaking, uh, their goals and objectives have been pretty consistent over a period of time. The manner by which they have sought to pursue and achieve those goals has become more impatient, assertive, and aggressive in recent years. But broadly speaking, I think what the Chinese would like to do, they would like to be recognized uh, as the regional leader and uh, a, a top global power. They would like to have their governance and economic models respected and admired around the world. And they would like to have their core interests respected. Those have been broadly continuous strands of, of Chinese policy for some time. And I don't, I don't see necessarily that uh, they have changed in recent years, but the manner in which China is using its power in pursuit of those goals has become more aggressive. Yeah, Brian, if I can, I, um, Dimitri, you're absolutely right, of course, that, that um, uh, the, it, there was an imperfect call uh, from the U.S., its allies, but, but I think, it, it, as Ryan said, also inside the Politburo and the, and the, and the, and the Standing Committee of, of what Xi Jinping was about and what he was going to do. Uh, one of the best educations I, I've gotten, uh, it wasn't when I was in government, but when I was out, I had the privilege of, of, uh, of helping my, my late colleague, uh, Brent Scowcroft, edit a book with, uh, uh, with, with uh, President Bush 41. Uh, and as I went through some of the primary source material and talked to the two of them about events uh, relating to the end of the Cold War, uh, what, you, what you realize uh, when you look at senior leaders is, uh, guess what? They're these brittle little people like the rest of us. They're making choices in real time. I dare say there were moments when Xi Jinping was pleasantly surprised with when he pushed on his colleagues in the Central Committee, what he was able to get away with, uh, and how the coalitions inside the Chinese government worked to his advantage, and 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 they, just accidents of history, things that happened uh, that that cleared the pathway for a more aggressive set of policies. In, in the same way that Gorbachev, uh, you know, was was put to deciding one night. Uh, whether or not the Berlin Wall would come down. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't plan this stuff. Uh, we would like to think they do. Uh, and that's why people study political science. Uh, but the reality is uh, uh, you, you, uh, you have to deal with these things in real time. And I suspect he's been encouraged by having a, a series of successes uh, that will have allowed him to be more, more aggressive perhaps even than Xi Jinping had imagined in his own models. Ryan, is that fair or am I overstating it? No, I think that's absolutely fair. And I think it's worth bearing in mind the historical context. I mean, China has had the best tailwind behind it over the last 20 years that you could ever design. Uh, the United States gets bogged down in the Middle East, invades Iraq. We have a global financial crisis. We struggle in Afghanistan. Uh, the Arab Spring takes root. Uh, it leads to massive refugee flows into Europe and elsewhere that spur populism. Donald Trump gets elected, um, pushes aggressively for an American first foreign policy. Meanwhile, in China, uh, they reap the benefits of their demographic dividend. Uh, their, their demographic workforce peaked in, in recent years. Um, all of this infrastructure and investment comes online. And you know, it, it's going to uh, be very difficult for China to replicate the, the tailwind uh, that they've had over the past 20 years. And if we get our house in order and, and uh, do a better job of avoiding mistakes, uh, I think that, uh, that it's going to become a more complex picture for them. Thank you. Our next question is from Ben P. How should we think about the impact of the Belt and Road Initiative? That seems to be the flashy public display of Chinese power abroad that at least ostensibly lies in the heart of much concern of the Western media, particularly in the midst of the pandemic as vaccines seem to be a likely tool of global public diplomacy. What is the appropriate level of alarm for Americans at the extension of Chinese influence in the developing world through the BRI and pandemic response? 
Well, I'll offer an initial thought and hope that uh, Kevin will join me in this. Um, I think that vigilance is warranted, alarm is not. Uh, there's a, I think, an open question of about whether or not China is buying itself uh, opportunities or challenges on the horizon. Um, the, the people who I have spoken with, veterans of the World Bank who have done this from a, for a living for their entire career, have said it's going to be really hard for China to meet anything resembling the expectations that they have set for themselves around the world. Uh, because they have put themselves out there as the pro providers of first and last resort for infrastructure projects in really difficult places of the world with uneven records of uh, rule of law, um, high degrees of kleptocracy. And so um, we'll see how this works out. Uh, the reason why I wouldn't be dismissive of it is that it is a serious uh, piece of work. And particularly when China is investing in ports um, and locking up uh, ports along strategic trade routes, that's something that, uh, that should grab our attention and something that we should be working to, to try to prevent. So I, I guess I would fall somewhere in the middle, um, not dismissive, not alarmist, um, but, but vigilant. Ryan, you make a point in the book that I think is worth amplifying that, that uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a good discipline to ask why the Belt and Road? Well, well, because they can, because they're cash rich right now. Uh, but it's also, uh, a, as you know, uh, a product of the fact that uh, unlike the United States, China has no allies. That's not an accident. That was a choice of Chinese foreign policy going back to 1949. But it doesn't, if you will, doesn't believe in alliance structure. And to some extent, you argue, or I, I hear you'd argue in the book, that this is a way of synthesizing uh, those relationships and amplifying Chinese power but without uh, an alliance structure. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, I think that's right. They're, they're trying to drive the benefits without the burdens of uh, needing to come to any country's defense. Well, uh, uh, Lauren, one final thought on this. I, uh, in, I was in China uh, about a year and a half ago and, and asking a friend of Ryan's about um, uh, the impact of Belt and Road. And he lifted up a water glass and said, um, you know where I'd like to see some Belt and Road? And this guy was from a rural part of China originally. His parents still are farmers. He said, I'd like to see a Belt and Road in China because there's no city in my country where you can pour water from the tap and drink potable water. I'd like some infrastructure here, uh, which I thought was chastening. Yeah. Thank you. And I think that lends really well to our next question. Um, this is from Thomas M. What do you make of China's recent crackdown on Jack Ma, as well as its more restrictive policy moves against Chinese media, finance, and broadly speaking, tech companies? Do they see these domestic assets as a threat to party power and influence? Um, my short answer is yes. Uh, that this is these are actions born of fear, uh, not opportunism. Uh, you know, it's very clear where dynamism comes from in the Chinese economy. It comes from the private sector. It comes from the Jack Ma's of the world. Uh, these people who, who create things, do things, change things. Uh, it does not come from state-owned enterprises. Uh, but if you look at where capital is flowing uh, inside the Chinese economy, it would tell a different story. Uh, it's getting concentrated in unproductive corners uh, of Chinese economy and society. And so I, I guess the question that we have to ask ourselves is why? Why does Beijing feel it necessary to pinch uh, Jack Ma and media companies, finance companies, tech companies, when it is so clearly disadvantageous to them to do so? And uh, I think it's a reflection of you know, this desire for control and efficiency. I think that those are sort of the two watchwords uh, if you needed to predict Xi Jinping's behavior. Anything that uh, increases control and increases efficiency are things that he's going to, to, to be supportive and enthusiastic about. Uh, but th these things come at a cost. And I think it's an open question over time of whether or not a uh, society and economy that becomes more closed and more rigid can still protect and preserve space for the type of dynamism that's going to be needed uh, to help spur China's economy forward. Well, uh, one, one footnote, if I can, Lauren, uh, our, uh, our mutual colleague, Bob Goldberg, uh, in talking about this issue, uh, posed to me the question, do these actions indicate confidence or unconfidence in the Chinese leadership? To Ryan's point about, uh, about why these choices are made, Lauren, it's, 
it, 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 it's in part uh, uh, not only because they can exercise control, but they feel a need to, which maybe ought to give you an insight as to how secure they are in their own leadership. Thank you. Our next question is from Erica B. How much stock should we put in China's no first use policy? And what is the future of US-China nuclear stability? The honest answer is I don't think anyone knows uh, how much stock to put into China's no first use policy. They, they've had this policy for a long time. Um, if they faced uh, overwhelming um, conventional risks, would they continue to adhere to it if it came at the cost of uh, becoming very vulnerable? It's, it's an impossible question to answer. Um, but <clears throat> I, I do think that this is an important issue uh, to get at because it speaks to a broader um, problem in the relationship, which is that risk reduction and crisis management mechanisms are dramatically immature relative to where they were with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And uh, if we don't find ways with urgency to begin to address some of these things, uh, we're going to find ourselves in a world that's, uh, that's just increasingly risky uh, in ways that I think are unhelpful for, for our long-term security. Thank you. Our next question is from William J., who is an adjunct professor at Fordham Law School. Just as Nixon and Kissinger triangulated against Russia by opening with China, are there opportunities to leverage Russia against China? Putin and Lavrov have imitated po uh, poignancy for a post-World War II Yalta world. Are there real politic possibilities to pry Russia alliance with China? as they have had historical animosity even during the Cold War? Well, my, my view on this, Lauren, it's a great question. Um, and I think that there were some in the Trump administration who had hoped that uh, the United States could pull Russia closer to it and further from China, sort of pull a reverse Kissinger and reverse Nixon as I think the question describes. Um, I'm a bit pessimistic about our ability to do that. Um, I think that the, a more realistic objective would be to try to slow the pace of convergence between Moscow and Beijing for the time being, and trust that over time that, uh, that the relationship between China and Russia will return to a more natural equilibrium. The relationship at the moment is unnatural by historical standards. China and Russia, they really don't like each other that much. Um, they're brought together both by shared, uh, shared anxieties, um, shared dissatisfaction with the United States and United States behavior, but also by a, a unique chemistry between the two leaders. Um, Putin and Xi are not going to be around forever. Um, and I'm not saying that we should be complacent and just wait for them to pass, but, but um, we, we need to have, I think, modest expectations because the risk is that if we, if we chase after this opportunity too far, it'll have uh, derivative effects for the rest of our policies towards China and Russia that I think will create second, third order effects that'll be unhelpful. But Kevin, what do you think? Well, look, uh, you describe in the book that a lot of the competition uh, between us and China uh, is occurring. And, and, and one of the important differences between the, the Soviet era uh, model of containment and, and what we face with China now is the size and significance of the Chinese economy and its relationship with that of the U.S., I, 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 a, a, a colleague of yours, uh, Ryan, uh, a few years back, described Russia as Denmark with nuclear weapons. Uh, it's it, it, the, the economic heft of Russia uh, is is so insignificant, and hence its its ability uh, to to, uh, uh, to to act in international space uh, is 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 very constrained compared to the, the myriad challenges we face with China. I think uh, to the questioner's point, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm actually at a point where I don't think it's useful to think in terms of that traditional kind of big power politics. I think we're, we're destined to be in a multipolar world. Uh, the, the fact of US alliance structures is such an enormal, uh, enormous advantage. I'd rather concentrate on doing more uh, with the people whose interests are ineluctably bound up with ours, the Europeans, the Japanese, the South Koreans, much of Africa uh, and, and Latin America. I think there's, there's so much upside there uh, potentially 
for uh, uh, an activist US policy uh, that if we put Russia on the shelf for 10 years, and that isn't an option, um, but but I wouldn't be I wouldn't be upset if that were to happen if if we didn't try to engage it as a major chess piece anytime soon. That's probably a failure of imagination on my part. Uh, but um, I, I I I would be very wary of trying to use it as a cat's paw. Bouncing off your conversation about our allies, um, we have a question from Tim P. How can the U.S. better leverage allies in Asia, particularly India and Japan? to constrain or distract China rather than to confront China directly? Well, I think that we saw a powerful example of what is possible last Friday uh, when the Quad leaders, the leaders of uh, the United States, Japan, Australia, and India met virtually for the first time. Uh, and what they did was uh, focus on COVID, uh, climate, and technology issues. They did not focus on China. Um, and I think that was deliberate by design. And it sent a powerful signal that uh, when the United States and its partners in the region pool resources and focus determination that we're capable of doing big things. And uh, the democracies are able to deliver in very meaningful ways. And so that's, that's the type of dynamic that I would encourage us to continue to build on, uh, to try to impose this race to the top dynamic where we put uh, big solutions to big problems on the table together with our allies and partners. And if the Chinese want to meet us uh, or exceed us, then that's great. The, the world will be a better place for it. Um, but let's, let's keep the Chinese on their back feet uh, responding to us rather than constantly chasing them around the world, uh, trying to subvert their initiatives. Kevin, what do you think? Uh, no, I, I I think that's absolutely right. Good good stewardship of uh, the alliance structure. Again, it's a card available to us and not to the Chinese. So I, I'd be grateful if we pay a lot more attention to that. And that seems where the Biden policy is going. Lauren, I'm very aware of 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 time, and and uh, our our hosts at the Eisenhower Institute have uh, uh, you guys uh, 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 have introduced me to real clock discipline, and I want to be respectful of that. We've got so many other good questions lined up, and I'm sorry to, to disappoint. I will say uh, for anyone uh, uh, who wasn't able to ask uh, a question, uh, get a copy of Ryan's book, because I dare say I think the answers, answers will be there uh, in large part. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us uh, and for your contribution uh, in, in, in this important work. Uh, and and uh, all, all the best to, to everybody and, and uh, our gratitude for uh, your joining us today. Ryan, any closing thought? All I want to do is offer my thanks to the Eisenhower Institute and especially to you, Kevin. Uh, you've been such a, a great friend and mentor, and uh, it's really been fun to have this conversation with you.